Je úterý 12. listopadu, tady je Lenka Kabrhelová a Vinohradská 12, spravodajský podcast Českého rozhlasu. Julia Jofi, American journalist and expert on Russia, the US and democracy. Hi, Julia. <laughs> Hi, hello. <laughs> Long time no see. Hi. So happy to welcome you here. So what do you make of you here on the pretext of the conference radio is organizing for 30 years of freedom? What would you say, where are we 30 years of having freedom? What's the stage we're in? You know, I keep thinking about this because, um, I, and I also keep thinking about this Polish book called uh, Dancing Bears, about how people uh, in this part of the world, especially the part of the world that I'm from, which is Russia and the former Soviet Union, were not used to freedom and didn't know what to do with it when it was given to them. Um, when you talk about the West, Western Europe, and the United States, they have less of an excuse. It's almost like they are spoiled by success. And I think in their case, it's kind of like um, a child who hasn't touched a hot stove in a long time. The first time she touched it, her, you know, it hurt and she knew never to do it again, but she hasn't done it in a while and um, thinks, you know, would it be so bad to touch a hot stove? And I think that's where we are in the West, where um, the Cold War seems a long time ago. World War II seems even longer ago. And all these structures that we've put in place, um, NATO, the European Union, the idea that uh, liberal representational democracy, freedom of speech are kind of universal good or universal values are things that we need not just because we've always been doing them this way, but because the alternative is horrifying. Uh, we've all kind of forgotten that lesson. And, you know, we're trying to reinvent the wheel or touch, touching the hot stove or, you know, pick your own metaphor. You were born in the Soviet Union, then you left in 1990 and went to the US. And as a journalist, you've covered Russia for three years um, and also then got back to the US and you covered it during the heat of the presidential campaign uh, when then was Donald Trump elected. And you often wrote about some similarities or moments that reminded you of Russia. Do you still see them? Yeah, uh, and I see them, unfortunately, more and more, um, especially in the behavior of Donald Trump, who behaves uh, in ways that are similar to Putin, Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, and Viktor Orban, the president of Hungary, and all kinds of dictators and autocrats like um, Erdogan of Turkey, because he just seems to have a natural affinity for them. And he thinks that's what masculinity looks like, and that's what uh, governance looks like, and that's what power looks like or should look like. Or Mohammed bin Salman of Saudi Arabia, he seems to have a natural affinity for these leaders, which is horrifying to see in an American president. The other thing I see, and I mean, you were there reporting side by side with me, both from Moscow and from Donald Trump's election. We were at the conventions together. Yeah. Um, I think what's also really interesting, and tell me if you think, uh, if this resonates for you, but watching the American population get not only so polarized politically, but in terms of information, that really reminds me of Russia, where one population, one population of the country gets one set of facts and information, and another set gets a totally different set of facts and information that doesn't intersect in any way with the first. And you have these two populations within one country living in totally parallel informational planes, which makes political any kind of politics or any kind of political discourse or any kind of political solutions or compromises impossible because, you know, they're operating in totally different um, universes. I do remember us talking about that and talking about that it was exactly the same in Europe, that it wasn't a thing that was just happening in Russia or in the US at that time, but also everywhere, which I guess maybe now we know a little bit more about that. But, but still, it's striking for me that in the US, how do you understand that, that people who were brought up in a free world with access to information, with access to maybe a little different education and understanding of what news mean and how you sort information and how you deal with it, 
how come this happened in the U.S.? Well, I think we got, uh, I think Fox News did a lot of the damage when it uh, was created in the mid-90s. And it was created not to be a source of information, but to be the informational wing of a political war machine. You know, mm -hmm. that was the stated purpose. And then it was masked in this or cloaked in this idea that, well, the other side is doing the same thing, but for the Democrats, which it wasn't. But once you frame the debate that way of, you know, we're just giving as good as we get, then it turns information into something that has sides and teams and alliances. And, um, you know, what Donald Trump's advisor, Kellyanne Conway, called alternative facts, which was just, you know, everybody, everybody's jaw dropped at the time, but now it's, you know, kind of... It, it'll be interesting to see how impeachment plays out because, again, there's uh, depending on the party you're in or your political affiliation or leanings, you operate with a totally different set of facts. They are alternative facts. Yeah, where do you see we move from this? Or where do you see the U.S. be moving from that? I don't know. I think the U.S. is, like I said, kind of spoiled by its own success. And I think that... This is something I often think about that, you know, we, uh, we went through this period of democracy promotion and uh, promoting regime change abroad and thinking that if we get rid of these people at the top, that everybody else would just immediately embrace democracy and uh, become liberal d democratic governments in our image. And it turned out that actually democracy is really hard work. You have to, you know, dig for information. You have to constantly pay attention. You have to rank candidates. You have to hold them to account. You can't just go and vote for, you know, every one candidate every four years. When you do that, the radicals kind of uh, on each on each end of the political spectrum take take control. And in some ways, br you know, bringing us back to our original mm -hmm. starting point. That was kind of the idea at the end of the Cold War, right? I remember, you know, the people I knew in the Soviet Union, um, kind of my parents' generation, who felt that, you know, if the wall just falls and if the Soviet Union, you know, if Gorbachev goes and if the Soviet Union is dismantled, then we'll be just like America, like that. Mm -hmm. And it turns out, Obviously, it didn't happen. You know, people that this is um, a habit of mind and a habit of um, behavior that you have to maintain all the time. It's not like breathing or, you know, uh, yeah, it's I, not totally natural. Yeah. And I guess it's maybe even more difficult for people in Central Europe or Central Eastern Europe, uh, Russia and former Soviet Union to get all those habits when no one taught you them. Exactly. No one told you what you're supposed to do and no one really knew. I remembered quite recently Václav Havel talking a lot about personal responsibility. Um, when you look at that, do you think and I don't mean to talk all the time about the US because you know both worlds in Russia, but are we aware of this, that we do have personal responsibility? I think people are waking up to that. I think 2016 was a big wake up call to a certain part of the American population. And um, I remember, were you still there when the Women's March happened? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. Did I you was. go? You you reported oh, yeah. on it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we were both there as all as usual. <laughs> and I don't know if you remember, like, if you had this feeling, but I thought it was a lot like Balotne, mm -hmm. the 2011 pro democracy protests in Moscow, 2011, mm -hmm. 2012. Um, a kind of well educated, well off um, population coming out to protest with witty signs and discovering that there are more of them than they thought and being so happy to find that out and uh, so kind of happy with just the fact that they came out that I which is what happened in Moscow where we again reported side by side <laughs> 2012 tw uh, 2011 2012 and I thought that protest fizzled because that's really all they did they came out uh, I mean, the Kremlin bl blocked them, but they came out with witty signs. They were excited that there were more of them than they thought, and they didn't go all the way. And I was worried that that would happen in the U.S., that, 
the march would be the beginning and the end of that. But in fact, in the States, there is a culture that the, that there isn't in Russia and maybe in certain countries in Central Europe, a kind of heritage and a culture that and a and an idea that I can run for office. And so you saw, especially women, uh, hundreds of women all over the country. There's never been a year like this, 2018, just regular people who ran for office up and down the ticket and every, everything from the local school board to seats in the Senate and Congress. And that to me was very different from a place like Russia, where a few people did that. But there is still this sense of politics is something that happens to us. It's decided somewhere over there behind the iconostasis. Um, but in America, there's still this idea that this kind of eternal optimism and idealism that never really goes away, uh, that, well, I'm just going to run for office. Screw it. I'm going to change it. It's this kind of, and that to me is very American and is very different and hard to explain. I think this is also something we've talked about mm, yeah. a lot is it's very hard to explain personally to Russians, this optimism, this idealism that um, Americans really believe and act on the belief that they can personally change their life, the world, uh, their communities around them, whereas I think, and I don't know if, if Czechs are like this, but Russians definitely, you know, will just, they turn fatalistic. After 2012, they all went into what was called internal immigration, and they kind of just said, well, I can't change anything. Why ruin my day or my life by trying? So I'm just going to focus on my family, on my friends, on my job. Wait and, it out. Yeah, and wait it out, exactly. Is that something that you've seen in... Uh, the Czech Republic. Well, this what you said could resonate with some people here because there were big protests. There was one big protest in the summer. Um, it was anti-government protests, but at the same time, it was many people were reporting at that time who were there, and I went to report and have a look, um, and they reported, you know, feeling surrounded by like-minded people, and they were saying exactly. You know, the fact that you mentioned that, oh, at least we find out that we're not alone in our beliefs in certain values and in the fact that Czech Republic should belong to the Western values. And what is interesting is to see and maybe to ask people about how much agency they feel that they mm -hmm. have over their life. Um, when you cover Russia and, the, and you're in the US and you live in the US, what is it that makes Americans so much more aware of the agency they have? Is it tradition? Is it upbringing? Is it culture? Why is it so difficult to introduce that whole idea here? Well, it was kind of, um, I mean, if you set aside the kind of the genocide of mm. Native Americans and the clearing of the land for uh, the colonists, it was in some ways... Um, a society that began from scratch. They had this utopian idea that they they were going to do, um, they were going to run a government in a way that was totally different from anything that had been done be been done before, based of course on Anglo-Saxon you know legal pr principles and gov uh, governance principles. But I think there is a lot to be said for hundreds of years of a certain kind of tradition. Also. I think Americans have the luxury that people from the Czech Republic or from the Soviet Union didn't have, which was two giant oceans to the east and west and two friendly neighbors to the north and south with like, they had tiny skirmishes in 1812 and 1848. Uh, not, they, they call them wars, but I think by our metric, they're <laughs> tiny skirmishes. And I think Americans... Um, have never, I, this is something I'm struck by all the time, especially now that I'm working on this book about um, Russian women in the 20th century going into the 21st. They've never, Russian, uh, Americans have never experienced what people in the Soviet Union, in Eastern Europe had to live through, this kind of cinematic levels of horror and absurdity and tragedy. And when you haven't gone through that, for generations, you there's nothing to jade you. There's nothing to kind of make you p pessimistic and idealistic, because there's you know history isn't constantly galloping through your kitchen and ruining everything and killing half your family and starving the other half. You know, um, 
so they feel that they have control because they have had control. I mean, unless you're like a person of color and, you know, there, there are all kinds of nuances in American history, obviously. But on the whole, uh, they've been uh, they haven't experienced the kind of history that, for example, mm. our families have experienced. And I think it's hard when I speak to Russian friends. Um, they've never really had an experience, even on a personal level, where they could just get up and change their lives. They don't, the, this like I, American idea of the power of positive thinking sounds like, excuse me, bullshit to them because there's nothing in their personal or um, experience or the experience of those around them or people in their uh, lineage that would bear that out. So I would get very frustrated talking to Russian friends who are complaining forever about a boyfriend or a job. And I'm like, well, break up with him or get a different job. And they would look at me like I'm, I'm speaking, you know, mm. a language they didn't understand because that was never part of their experience. And that was never something that was reinforced the way in America you could just get a different job, you know. Mm. Um, well, it's yeah. interesting because I think for the first time in Russia and for full in the US, especially the last year, I was there five years and the last year I had some room to think about things. I only then realized how traumatized this whole region is, meaning yes. Central Europe, Central Eastern Europe and how it goes through generations. So when you cover now, you're writing the book about Russian women and also you see America, so you have this whole comparison, right? Do you see Central Eastern Europe, the societies here, working with the trauma? Are we even aware of that? Well, I can't speak for Central and Eastern Europe because it's not a region, unfortunately, that I've um, focused on in detail. But, you know, I was in 2015, Svetlana Alexievich, who was a Belarusian writer, was a former Soviet journalist, um, won the Nobel Prize for Literature. And I had never heard of her before then, and I started reading her books, especially Secondhand Time, which was about basically the world after 1991, the world of the former Soviet Union after 1991, which also gets back to our, uh, you know, the beginning of our conversation. And reading it in 2017, which was what, like 15 years after I really started studying Soviet history, Russian literature, reporting on the place, I realized I've been thinking about this place completely wrong. I have not brought the right level of empathy to this place because these are horribly traumatized people on an individual level and a, on a societal level um, that have never worked through this trauma either personally or on, a, again, a, so, a societal scale. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, you could make the, and some scholars have made this uh, argument that the same behavior that you would see in a person who has post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, aggression, paranoia, lack of trust, um, a kind of jumpiness, um, trying to preempt any kind of aggression, you could, you could almost see it, and maybe it's being too charitable to the, you know, the government of Putin, but I think a part of it is informed by that, by people around him, by people in society who support him and for whom his kind of rhetoric really resonates, because it does for a lot of people in Russia. Because Russia never had, you know, Germany was conquered or it, it surrendered. And there were the Nuremberg trials and there were reparations and there was decades and like several generations of Germans who had to confront what they had done. And, uh, I mean, I think eventually they decided that's enough feeling bad, but Russia never went through that. Russia never really lost. Russia was never conquered. It never had a lustration process. It never, uh, briefly grappled with what happened in the 1930s in the terror and the famine in Ukraine, but that all very quickly went away because people had to survive because the nineties were hard. And as I think they were here. And, uh, you know, going to a psychotherapist is in some ways a luxury of time and money on a personal level and on a social level. It's something that somebody who's comfortable and affluent can do. And when you're busy trying to survive and just try, and it's also just not part of Russian culture. You just have to kind of be strong and move on and not, you know, mm. 
вытирать сопли. I don't. Do you feel that? What, I keep what about, about in the Czech Republic? Well, I guess it's similar, although a lot of those things are lighter. So, but that again, that goes back to your individual perspective and how you live through through those years. So, I have no doubts that the '90s were really difficult, but based on my surroundings and where I lived. It might have been difficult at some point, but it was also a very optimistic time full of freedom and expectations and, you know, this whole thrill and excitement that suddenly you can do so many things, or at least you can think that you can do them. And and you could do them after all. Um, but yeah, of course, we see now, you know, the, the aftermath of you know, privatization and, you know, the accumulation of wealth, it, which is a little similar to Russia, that only mm -hmm. certain people were able to get hold of significant amount of, you know, wealth. And that was often the old elite, right? They yeah, had the connections, exactly. which so, sort of, so people look around, they say, these are the same people. So what, what was the revolution, right? Yeah, sometimes I think that can happen or it triggers resentment, understandably, because people feel mm -hmm. left out. And like not part of the part of the society, although yeah, yeah. Oh, but you guys, had you guys had you guys had illustration. So what do you what, what do you think about that? Did that did that help or hurt things? Oh God, that's a question. Because I guess now for I'm sorry to keep interrupting you, but this is now I hear in liberal circles in America people saying, well, whenever Donald Trump is out of office, be it 2020 or 2024, or if he dies before then, we have to think about illustration. Really. Which I'm like, oh my god! <laughs> so, what do you think? What did it well, help or hurt? I would Czech say society? that it was a different system, right? Obviously, and that was a that was a different. See, Americans idea have a different that. pain tolerance than Eastern Europeans, right? Yeah. Oh God, yeah. I don't feel um, like I should be the person to pass on judgments on how illustration worked or didn't work. But certainly, what the aim was is to ban certain group of people who were privileged before and who were part of the nomenclature that they would still be able to run the country politically. Um, but that didn't account to the economic level, yeah. right? So, so it kind of transpired and it went on to the economical uh, economic level which which is like the common understanding at the same time it seems that people are well we have a prime minister who is in the um archives the slovak archives of the um former secret police and people don't seem to mind and hmm. and he's a prime minister so you know maybe people don't care anymore or at least part of the society um and things have been changing it's been 30 years so so maybe the um, certain things that were very alive 30 years ago are not anymore and mm -hmm. people's interests in how they vote um, are different. It's, there's an interesting, the Czech radio um, made um, a big survey on the Czech society 30 years on and it's really interesting. A lot yeah. of answers are actually there um, for anyone who is interested so they can peek it in and have yeah. a look. Um, but what you mentioned before, like I keep thinking about when, sorry to get back to the trauma, when you have it on this national level. So, of course, it's good to have empathy and to have understanding where it comes from. And I, I thought about it a lot when I was in Russia, but also at the same time, you have to, as another state, deal with it somehow, right? When you have a leader who is maybe acting upon a trauma or leading a traumatized nation, but he still can act way too assertive or aggressive like aggressively and invade other countries so how do you wield how do you deal with that where does your empathy end right so do we need some like global treatment or what <laughs> is it <laughs> well yeah i don't i don't mean to imply in any way that you know oh vladimir putin is traumatized therefore go ahead and invade <laughs> ukraine or georgia or estonia or whatever you want i just think basically on a social level it makes or like you said, leading a traumatized nation, they, they see this stuff as justifiable. I think maybe even more than this, though, it's the history of empire. And I think in this, Russia and the U.S. are very similar, mm -hmm. right? They believe they're exceptional nations. They're giant. I think the geographic size is is really important here. Um, and 
this kind of the phantom limbs of empire. You know, I remember in 2014, a friend of mine was going to, and this was before the fighting really started in East Ukraine, but a friend of mine was flying from Moscow to Kiev and the taxi driver drove him to the domestic departures term terminal. And my friend said, what are you, what are you doing? I, I told you I'm going to Kiev. And he's like, oh, crap, I forgot that it's a separate country now. And my friend was like, well, it's been almost 25 years. You should maybe get used to it, right? And um, when I was in, I remember when I went to Georgia for the first time in 2010 with a friend and my mom was calling me and I sent her just the Georgian number, the, the Georgian cell phone number I had. And I get this panicked email from her and she's like, where are you? Are you alive? I've been calling you for several days and I can't get through. The number you gave me isn't right. I said, I'm sure it is. How are you? And then she realized she had been dialing it with the Russian country code. <laughs> and again, this is a person who, just so you know, this was a person who grew up with Samazdat, who, you know, read the Solzhenitsyn and the Gulag Archipelago when she was in third grade and whose parents were dissidents and who hated the Soviet regime so much that she took her two kids, she and her husband, my father, took their two kids and were willing to never see their family or friends ever again because they hated the regime so much. But even in those people, there's that kind of subconscious um, mm. imperial mentality. She was telling me, I think I've told you about this, uh, when I was learning about the Velvet Revolution in college, in my Soviet history class, and Perestroika, Glasnost, and the fall of the wall, and all of this stuff. And I remember asking my parents, you know, you lived through a crazy period in history. I mean, just a cataclysmic change. Do you remember, you know, this was on TV in the Soviet Union in the 80s. And she said, yeah, we, again, we hated the regime, but when we saw the Baltic splitting off or the wall come down or the Velvet Revolution, on one hand, we were happy for them. On the other hand, we thought, hey, this is ours. Where are you going? So, I mean, again, and if it's in those people, mm. you know, imagine the people who didn't mind the Soviet Union, who thought it was great, or who think that, you know, um, Vladimir Putin's actually a great leader, plus the trauma. Yeah. Again, it doesn't give them an excuse, and you should never invade, you know, disclaimer, you should never <laughs> invade uh, <Thank> you. <laughs> neighboring countries. Um, I just mean in the sense of the empathy, in the sense of approaching, because what I do is mostly kind of profiling people, politicians, mm. regular people, um, in terms of understanding what makes them tick and how their brains are wired, I think it's useful to bring all those perspectives and not just be like, hey, you're a bad imperialist, which they might be. Mm. But there's also, I think, it's all more this complicated. other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's more subtle. Well, it points to, at least for me, right, how difficult it is to achieve freedom, be it inner freedom or societal freedom. And... And understand that and respect other people's freedom as well and their demands for freedom. So when we go back to the question at the beginning, so where we are 30 years on. So when you, we both talked and lived through the 90s and through the time, very optimistic one. The end where, of history. Exactly, where it seemed that, you know, freedom is a given and this is a free world and, and all of us can achieve what we want to. So where are we 30 years after that? Was that optimism just a blip or is it a trend that we might, you know, considering now the period of authoritarians rising and populism rising, are we going to go back to the optimism at some point? Well, I think it's, um, then you get into the question of how does, his, how does history or progress develop? Is it teleological? Is it, you know, linear and progressive? Or does it, is it cyclical? Or is it just something in between? And I think that when it comes to the Americans, there is a sense that progress is linear and that it's, that it's irreversible, which we've seen as not true. And, you know, I remember talking to my father who was really the driving force for us emigrating. I mean, he just hated the system. 
And he says he remembers just even as a little kid, just feeling like he was born in the wrong country and just hated everything about, you know, the corruption, the total, like the lack of freedom. Um, talking to him in 2014, after Russia invaded Ukraine twice, seized Crimea, and looking at the polls and how people we knew who we thought had been pro-Western liberals were like, yeah, but Crimea is Russian, and so it should be ours. And looking, you know, how looking at the polls that showed Putin's popularity rating spike and the approval of the Crimean annexation, which was totally illegal, um, and the crackdown on civil society that followed, I remember talking to my father and he said, you know, it's really amazing to me. They had, the Russians had a stretch where they have never been so free and so well off. And they traded it in for a peninsula like that. You know, because it was also, you know, the economics, uh, the economic sanctions hurt. The economy started flatlining around that time. And he was like, for nothing. Like, and it, and it took, you know, a couple weeks. They just, they were willing to hand it in, uh, hand their freedom in for a peninsula so fast. And I think there is something analogous happening in the States where, I mean, personally, I think it's called caused by racial grievance, right? We had one black president out of 44 white, you know, out of 44 presidents, 43 of whom were white. And the response of the white population in the United States was to elect somebody who's, you know, kind of quasi fascist. And you look at the polls of, especially of Republicans, and this is, you know, getting back to our point of, or our, uh, what we talked about, where there's different sets of facts, it also seems like people believe there are different sets of rules, mm -hmm. depending on which team you're on. So I remember early 2017, when all this information was coming out about Russian interference in the election, for example, polls showed that most Republicans thought that they didn't mind Russia interfering in the election if it benefited a Republican. They all disapproved if it benefited a Democrat, but if it benefited their team, they were okay with it. There were polls that showed that Republicans, you know, they were asked if Donald Trump suspended the 2020 presidential campaign, would you mind? And most of them said no. And it's, you know, for the Russians, okay, they had like 20 years out of a thousand year history. Americans started with this. It's not like they went from a, you know, absolutist mm -hmm. monarchy, uh, theocratic monarchy to 20 and like totalitarian communist dictatorship to 20 years. Like they started with a, re a representative republic. And then also like they handed it in like that because of racial resentment, because of class resentment, whatever it was. They were happy to have a foreign power meddling in their election. I mean, the holy of holies, right, of, of mm -hmm. American democracy. They were willing to call off elections. They, um, and that reminded me of a lot of polls in Russia, right, where, you know, most Russians, when we still live there, believe that it was okay for the government to lie to them on TV if it benefited the state. Yeah, and on top of everything, <laughs> ordinary Russians would probably not have access to other um, source of information right, but than Americans the state-run TV, and Americans do, right? So, so that's yeah. a puzzling moment. Puzzling is see. a diplomatic way of saying it, yeah. <laughs> well, that wasn't too much of an optimism <laughs> to the end. <laughs> but maybe not all is yeah. so wrong. <laughs> but it's, again, to me, it's, it's the speed with which... Um, and again, this was the party that when Obama was, in, was president, this was the party that had this almost religious approach to the Constitution. The way they talked about the Constitution was that it was kind of like the Bible and the founding fathers were like the apostles of Jesus, you know, and, and that we are all about the Constitution and a literal interpretation of it. And we're not going to, we're going to appoint literal, literalist judges and Obama is violating the division of power and blah, blah, blah. And he's taking too much executive power. Suddenly when it's Trump, who, I mean, like the, there were a lot of Obama did rule a lot by executive action, but you look at what Trump is doing and they're totally fine with it because it's their team. And it's that, I, that's a big 
portion of the country that thinks this way. And that just makes me despair. And I, it's also interesting watching my parents mm. see this because I think in America, uh, nobody buys into the American dream the way immigrants do. I think Americans who were born there, who have lived in America for several generations, they kind of... A bit more skeptical about it. Well, no, they're just, they just take it for granted. It's just like the air they breathe. It's just always been there and there's no reason it would ever go away. But people who opt in to America, especially people like my parents who came from a totalitarian regime, um, to watch them be disillusioned with what's happening in America to see them draw comparisons to the political life they knew mm. under the Soviet Union is kind of, it kind of breaks my heart. I mean, they tore up their whole lives and I mean, I think they're not, I don't think they regret it, but it's, um, it's kind of heartbreaking on the 4th of July, for example, this was always a big holiday in our family. Mm -hmm. And, um, this 4th of July, my father said to me and my sister, you know, we became, so when my parents became citizens, we were still kids. And so we were naturalized, um, mm -hmm. kind of automatically. And he said, you know, you should really look into getting some kind of document that proves that you're a citizen. It really is heartbreaking. Yeah. Well, since we talk about the U S and U S believes in linear progress, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think it will end up in something positive, maybe is too strong word, but that it is a linear process that out of all of this, including the presidential campaign and who knows how that will gonna end up, but that something, you know, cathartic may mm -hmm. come out of that. What is it? Thesis, antithesis, and <laughs> <laughs> get back to our Marxist roots. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I think nothing is guaranteed and I think that's why the 2020 election is so important, because if Trump wins again, then it kind of bakes everything in. It's, uh, it is a referendum on what he's done with the country in the last few years. And if he's voted back in, then that's the country saying, this is the road we want to go on. Um, America has gone, you know, America zigzags a lot. And um, there's always a kind of a revanchist period after a period of progress, like Nixon came after the Civil Rights Act and um, the, was it, redemption came after the Civil War and Reconstruction. There's always, you know, a couple steps back. I hope that, if, that you know, if American history is any guide, that this will just be one step back and we can continue moving forward. But I really worry. I think that, you know, Having been a student of history, you know, nothing is guaranteed. No country sticks around forever. No experiment lasts forever. And I don't know if I'm going to see the end of the ex American experiment in my lifetime or if this will end up being a blip. And that level of uncertainty is in and of itself kind of um, terrifying. Julie Ayofi, thank you so much. <laughs> Always bringing a positive <laughs> a note spin to on end. things. Yes, <laughs> thank you. It was Thanks a pleasure. for having me. Thank you.